Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and balance coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hello, everybody, and happy almost New Year. It's Wendy here. I'm actually recording this podcast after Christmas and before New Year's. Normally, I record the podcast episodes in advance and have them scheduled um, to publish, but with this one, I really wanted to make sure that I did it um, in a timely fashion so I didn't record it way in advance because I felt like it wouldn't feel... Um, it wouldn't feel very real um, if I recorded it in advance. So what I wanted to do today was reflect a little bit on 2020, what I've learned about myself in the last year, um, and also talk to you about rethinking New Year's resolutions. I have lots of ideas for ways to set New Year's resolutions in a very different way this year that I think is going to serve you far better. Um, if you're the typical person who sets a resolution every year, only has it stick for the first you know, couple of weeks, um, and then finds himself in a situation where it feels impossible to keep doing it at the level that they want to keep doing it, which leads to you just kind of giving up on it altogether. Instead, I want to give you some really fresh um, ideas for setting resolutions that actually might lead to some meaningful change this year, which is obviously the whole point. Um, But let's start first by by doing a little bit of a reflection back in terms of what 2020 was like. I mean, for all of us, it was just the weirdest year in history, I think. Um, I've, I've never lived through a year like this one, and I doubt you have either. So in March, we got blindsided by COVID here, um, as, as most people did around the world. Um, and that led to us being in lockdown for March, April, May, um, where I live in Nova Scotia on the East coast of Canada. And that led to me as a small business owner, having to stop and really try to think hard about where it is I wanted to go with my business and how I was going to do that when I couldn't see people face to face. Because for the last 10 years or so, as I've been building this coaching practice, a huge piece of my practice has been face to face coaching. Now, over the last few years, that has transitioned to probably 50% online coaching, um, just as a result of my client base being um, less local um, and spread kind of across North America. But I still had a big piece of my Um, of my business that was based on seeing people in office, my in-office visits. And so I had to, I had to take a few days. I actually took a couple of weeks. Um, It really, to be honest, felt like stopped in my tracks by COVID and was paralyzed for several days. And I, I'm guessing that some of you can identify with that feeling. I just felt like, what am I going to do? And what is this going to look like? How, how am I going to make this work? I had invested so much in building this coaching practice. I am lucky enough to now do something that I absolutely love. And the last thing I wanted was to have to let that go. So I took some time, reflected on it. I had just by chance um, taken a risk earlier on in the year and decided to enroll in a new certification program through the This Naked Mind Institute around alcohol-free life coaching. And that was scheduled to start at the beginning of March. The timing for that couldn't have been better because, of course, March, April, May were a little bit slower for all of us here in the lockdown, and that gave me some time to actually focus on that program um, and really throw myself into it. Um, but I needed to figure out how to make this business work entirely online, and that was that felt very, very risky for me. Um, but I transitioned all of my existing coaching clients to the online um to, the, to an online platform. I got Zoom butt like the rest of you guys did. I still have it. I'm sitting here right now in my chair <laughs> recording this um, recording this solo podcast. Um, and I've been in this chair a lot this year. Um, but I was able to, to convert the business to entirely online. And to be perfectly honest, it's working far better for me. Um, partly because as a result of that, this Naked Mind certification and um, the, the kind of next decision I made around my business, which was also super scary, which was to narrow my niche. Um, so for years, I had been working with women around burnout and balance. Um, but in the course of the uh, coaching certification um, around alcohol-free living, I realized that that was something I really did want to specialize in. It was something I was really passionate about. I've gone through it myself. Um, I was a gray area drinker. Um, I haven't had a drink now for three years. My life is immeasurably better as a result of that decision 
I don't regret it one bit. I never look back on it. Um, and I want to do whatever I can to help share that with other busy women who are feeling like their relationship with alcohol is no longer serving them. So I narrowed my niche in July, August of this year, just as I was getting certified in that um, coaching certification. And that was really scary because, of course, when you narrow your niche, there's always that fear that you're going to lose clients um, and you'll have trouble staying busy. But um, my mentor, um, Annie Grace, was right about that. She kept telling me that if you narrow your niche, it's actually going to have the opposite effect and that you will become more specialized and people will be able to find you who need you. And that's exactly what happened. My practice has actually just um, grown in an incredible way over the last uh, six months, um, which is really, really exciting for me. I feel like I'm in the exact zone that I want to be in with it. And um, I can't wait to see what 2020 brings for me. Um, the other things that happened this year that were kind of risky, but that ended up working out for me were, um, I appeared twice on the, this naked mind podcast. I was a guest on that podcast twice. Now this naked mind, for those of you who don't know what it is, if you haven't been listening to this podcast, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. This naked mind is, um, a movement. It was first a book called this naked mind written by Annie Grace, um, and then really turned into, a, a movement, um, of, um, based in this idea that freedom from alcohol is totally possible. Um, and it's really, uh, I'm not going to try to explain it in five minutes on this, on this podcast, but it's really based in a couple of principles. One is this idea of self grace. So really just extending grace to yourself, getting out of the shame and blame cycle. And then the second piece of it really is curiosity. So really getting curious about your relationship with alcohol. What does it look like? Why are you feeling the way you're feeling? Why is it hard for you to not drink? Um, how does it feel when you drink? Um, and just getting really getting curious about it and starting to learn more about your relationship so that you can, um, you can start to identify some of the underlying beliefs that are making it difficult for you to achieve the life that you want, which is a life where you have made alcohol small and irrelevant. Um, anyway, I've, I've worked through all of that, and that is now a big piece of what I do. And when I appeared on the This Naked Mind podcast for the very first time, which was um, felt very scary to me, that happened. I recorded it, I think, in May, maybe, of this of 2020, and it aired in August. Um, I told my story um, around gray area drinking and um, my journey to becoming alcohol free on that podcast. Now that is a podcast that has over 5 million downloads. Um, so, um, not my episode, but just in total, it's a very popular podcast. So I was really nervous about that, about telling my story felt risky, but, um, also felt really good to just be honest about it and own it and not have any, um, shame around the fact that, um, that that was an area that I decided to make change around. Um, and it was a really positive choice on my, my part, and it felt really great to own that on that podcast. I then appeared, I uh, had the opportunity to appear as a guest coach on um, a coaching episode of this Naked Mind podcast, uh, which aired in, uh, I think at the end of November it came out, where I talked about burnout and alcohol and answered some questions from listeners, specifically around the topic of stress management and alcohol. And that was just an incredible experience as well, just to be able to do that on that size of a platform also felt risky, but, um, but felt pretty great. And I've had really great response from it. So those were just some of the big kind of, um, risks that I took in 2020. It was a risky year for me in the midst of all the chaos that was the pandemic and trying to manage my kids. And I had two, I have two kids in high school trying to manage their, um, schooling from home in the spring, which was tricky. And then their transition back to in-person classes this fall, which was also tricky. Um, and, um, and then the last thing that I have done in 2020 that I'm actually very, very proud of is starting this podcast. And I know that, um, if you're listening to this, it's probably because you, um, have listened to other episodes and you're enjoying the podcast. I just want to let you know that I am loving doing it. And, um, I'm so glad so many of you are listening to this podcast. Please keep listening. I've got all kinds of great episodes lined up, great guests lined up for the new year. So that's 2020 for me. And as we head into 2021, I'm, I'm actually feeling pretty optimistic. I am feeling less panicked about the pandemic than I was. Now, I happen to live in a part of Canada where we have the pandemic very well under control. So we've had really good, um, really a really good approach to it, I think. It's been very solid and it's enabled us to keep our numbers pretty low. So we feel pretty safe here. And I recognize that that's not, that's not going to be the case 
um, for everybody listening to this podcast, but I do feel very lucky um, in that regard. But mostly I'm just really excited to see what the next year brings for me. Um, now that I have taken this, you know, taken these risks that felt so scary, but that have led to some really pretty incredible things. And I just wanted to reflect on that and share that with you, because if you've got something you've been thinking about doing for a long time, honestly, sometimes you just have to take that leap of faith. Um, you know, what if it goes right? One of my favorite coaching questions, you know, we tend to go into it's oh, what if it goes wrong? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if it actually goes right? You know, and I think this year for me has been a great um, example of what happens when it goes right and what, and, and, you know, and just kind of what can happen if you take, if you take some risks. Um, So that's 2020 for me. And I hope that, I hope that you've had some time to reflect on 2020 and take some lessons away from it. Um, You know, I've learned lots of great things about humans and what we need in terms of our need for connection um, and also you know about our genuine goodness and kindness that we have as people and I've seen so many examples of that over the year of people just taking care of people that have just well, just really just warmed my heart. Um, but today what I want to talk about to get to kind of the meat of this podcast is I want to talk about New Year's resolutions. This is something that um, almost every year I do a blog post or um, some kind of a social media post on New Year's resolutions because I think it's just, it can just be such a trap for us. And what I wanted to do today was provide you with some options. If you're somebody who's been making resolutions year after year and keeping them going for a short time, but then, you know, getting overwhelmed when your life gets lifey and finding that you can't keep them going and then feeling like a failure as a result of that, which leads to you just kind of getting into a funk, getting really hard on down on yourself and um, probably engaging in some not so um, helpful um, behavior as a result, then um, this podcast is for you. I want to give you several options for different ways to look at resolutions. And you can pick from these. If you're listening to this and you're thinking about setting resolutions or you've already set resolutions, I'm going to encourage you to hit pause on those till you've listened to these options because I want you to think about rethinking your resolutions this year. So the first thing I want to show, kind of throw out there as an option is this. What if you resolve to make no more resolutions? I mean, I think this is probably the most powerful resolution we can make, the most powerful promise we can make to ourselves. Stop making these big, sweeping promises and commitments to yourself that you can't keep. How liberating would it be to not have to set any more resolutions? What if we started thinking about, um, what if we just started thinking about as a long-term goal, the idea of getting to January of 2020, 2022, so next year, and feeling like we didn't have any changes left that we needed to make. Our lives were good. We were feeling good with where we were. We were happy and content. That was my goal years ago. Years and years ago, I decided I don't want to be making resolutions year after year. I just want to deal with some of these things. I just want to make the change. I want to give myself a chance to feel what it feels like to be cruising into the December holiday season feeling pretty fantastic and not feeling like there was anything that I needed to imminently change in my life, that I was actually pretty satisfied with my life. So if you're currently thinking to yourself, oh, I need to do all of these things. These are my New Year's resolutions. I'm going to, you know, quit quit drinking. I'm going to lose 50 pounds. I'm going to start going to the gym five days a week. If you've got that in your head right now, I want you to think if this is an option. What if you just let that go and said no? I'm not going to do that because the truth is that doesn't work. And I know you know that because because you've done that year after year and it has not led to lasting change. That's because humans are not good at making extreme overwhelming change. We just can't make it last. It's too much for us. What if you just let go of those resolutions and said, nope, I'm going for a long-term goal this time. And the long-term goal is this time next year, I want to feel like there's nothing major left for me to do. Um, And the way to do that, is to set this, and this kind of moves into my second option, which is what if we started setting goals around how we wanted to feel instead of what we wanted to do or accomplish? What I mean by that is what if we started setting qualitative goals instead of quantitative goals? So we're really, really good as humans at setting goals that involve quantitative, you know, measurable goals like I want to go to the gym five times a week. I want to lose 50 pounds. I want to stop drinking for 30 days. Those are goals that are quantitative. So they're really easy to measure, Um, but they don't really have anything to do with how we want to feel. 
we sometimes make assumptions that if we do those things, we're going to feel a certain way. Um, but the goal is not the feeling. The goal is the action. What if we started rethinking resolutions? And this year, we set resolutions around how we wanted to feel instead of how we wanted to act or be. Now, this one ties in really nicely with what I was just saying, that idea of, um, you know, not setting really drastic extreme resolutions this year, but instead making a goal that this time next year you want to feel a certain way, right? So you can combine those two options. And instead of setting specific quantitative goals for December um, of all these things that you're going to change, instead saying to yourself, I want to figure out how to get to a place where I feel this way. And then spend some time actually articulating how it is you want to feel and really dig into that. Get a journal out and, and start writing down, like, how is it I want to feel? For me, and this has always been, this is not always, but this has been my goal now for the last, I don't know, probably five or six years since I started really rethinking resolutions and really started focusing more on the quality of my life as opposed to the quantity of my accomplishments, I guess is the best way to think of it. Um, I have always, um, for, for years, as I said, I've always used this as my goal. My goal is when I lay my head down on my pillow at the end of the night to be able to say to myself, that was a good day. That's it. That's my goal. And it's all about feel. It's all about how I want to feel at the end of the day. I want to feel like it was a good day. It doesn't mean it was a perfect day. It doesn't mean there weren't things about that day that weren't really hard. But at the end of the day, I want to say to myself, no, that was an okay day. It was good. I, I, you know, there were some good parts to that day. And when I started focusing on that as my goal, instead of all of the things I needed to do every day, um, that really shifted things for me. That's what led me to starting to really experiment with a practice around gratitude, which I think I've talked about before on this podcast, one of my favorite coaching tools, one of my favorite tools for um increasing your daily joy and the quality of your days is to start practicing gratitude. Um, it's also what led me to meditation. In fact, it's the thing that led me to dealing with my one big thing, my one big domino, as we call it in this naked mind, we talk about the one big thing that if you were able to change it would make everything else in your life that much easier or maybe even irrelevant. It would basically it would basically help you to solve all the other problems in your life if you just dealt with this one big thing. Well, the one big thing for me a few years ago was wine. And I knew it. I knew it was the one big thing. But until I started focusing on how I wanted to feel, you know, and what I deserved in terms of the quality of my days, I didn't feel like I was ready to tackle wine. Um, but it became really clear to me when I started focusing on qualitative goals and on, on how I wanted to feel that if I didn't tackle wine, if I didn't throw everything at that, that I would never have the quality of life that I wanted and that I deserved. So um, quality of life, um, quality, quality based goals versus quantitative goals is another option for resolutions this year. Now listen, if you combine one and two, so you say to yourself, yeah, that makes sense. I'm not going to set any extreme goals for January. Instead, I'm going to set a qualitative goal for how I want to feel. And I'm going to give myself time to get there. So I'm going to say, by this time next year, I want to feel this way. And then I'm going to journal the heck out of that and get really detailed about how I want to feel. Then what I'm going to suggest you do is reverse engineer that goal. And what I mean by that is take a calendar, break it down by month, and um, put your end goal, which is your qualitative goal as to how you want to feel for this time next year. So let's say January 1st of 2022. And then reverse engineer it. So if that's where you need to be by January 2022, what do you, how, where do you need to be by December 1st of 2021? Where do you need to be by November 1st of 2021? By October 1st of 2021? So kind of reverse engineer it so that you have basically built a series of steps that will eventually get you to that place. That will allow you to do, um, which the, the last option that I wanted to talk to you about for resolutions, that will allow you to bring in this approach to resolutions, which is, habit stacking. Now, this is something I talk about all the time. And this is, in my experience, and I have a lot of experience in helping really busy people make permanent positive change. In my experience, um, the way to make that happen is through this system of habit stacking, which really just means that you are, um, you're focusing on making one small change at a time. So instead of taking on big, massive changes, like I'm going to lose 50 pounds, I'm going to go to the gym five days a week, I'm going to um, 
you know, and I'm going to quit alcohol and stop smoking. Instead of doing all of that at once, instead what you do is you take one small change at a time and you work on that until you've got that down. So until you've got that to a place where it's, where it's pretty automated, which is when it's become a habit. Um, and then, and only then, do you add something else into the mix in terms of something else that you're working on. Now, we know um, that it takes on average 66 repetitions for humans to create habit, habits. Um, and that's kind of an average a habit of aver, average difficulty or challenge. If it's a really simple habit, you might create it before the 66 days. If it's a more complicated habit, and what I mean by that is something that has a lot of emotional triggers, you know, and a lot of kind of um, strategic um, roadblocks or obstacles to making it happen, it might take longer than 66 days. Um, but if you just accept 66 days as the number, um, what becomes really clear is that we are not setting ourselves up for success with most, most of these goals that we set for ourselves. Because what we're doing almost always is trying to do that through really extreme quick fix approaches. And so something like a three-week cleanse is not going to do anything to change your habits permanently. In fact, it's going to be more damaging um, in the long run um, than it's going to be productive for you. Um, because three weeks, a three-week cleanse is 21 days and it takes 66 days on average. You need at least three times that in order to get to a place where any of those changes that you've made become, um, become automated for you and become habitual. Um, so all of these short-term, like extreme changes that we take on um, even things like dry January, to be perfectly honest, it's a, it's a good experiment for you, but you need to recognize that in order to make that a lasting habit, to actually make some permanent change, it needs to go on for longer than that month um, because you just simply will not be at a place where your brain and your body have started to habitually think that way and habitually act that way. So the habit stacking is a way around this. It's the opposite of quick, extreme fixes. And it's something that I have been advocating for years and all of my programming is based on this idea. When I'm working one-on-one -on -one with clients, what I'm doing is helping them to stack these habits. We figure out where to start, what makes sense in terms of where to start. Sometimes it's their one big thing. Um, sometimes that's where we start. Other times we say, well, we're probably not ready to tackle that one big thing. We need to work on building a base of just kind of some simple, healthy habits that you can rely on as a foundation um, so that you have some something underneath you, something to kind of rest on, something to bounce back from, something to help you create some, build some resiliency, um, which will then enable you to, to tackle that one really big thing um, that you know you need to change. So depending on who I'm working with, um, what we tackle first is different. But what we always do is start working on one thing and one thing only. Um, and we work on that until the client starts to build some confidence around it. So they really start to feel like they're accomplishing it, they're doing it, and we're getting we're really getting the regular reps in um, with it. Um, and only then do we start thinking about what else we can add to that. And what happens with this is over the course of the year, if you think about it, if you just made one moderate, small to moderate change a month, every month for the next 12 months, with a goal of getting to a place where you felt like, you know, your days were more joyful, um, if that was your goal, you just wanted to be able to say to yourself at the end of the day, that was a good day. There are so many little things that you can do over the course of the next calendar year. You can work on one thing a month um, and slowly start stacking another thing on top of the first thing and the second thing and so on over the course of the year, you'll find that at the end of the year, you have now made change in 12 areas of your life. And cumulatively, those small changes can lead to massive transformations. Again, that's the idea of habit stacking. It works. I know it works because this is what I do day in and day out with people. I help, I use habit stacking as part of how I help coach around alcohol. Habit stacking is how I coach around food and around burnout and balance and career change and all of it. It's all about habit stacking. It's about one small change at a time instead of taking on overwhelming, extreme, quick fix um, approaches to making change. So Hopefully, I have given you a number of things to think about with your resolutions. If you've got a resolution that you had preset before you listen to this podcast, go back and rethink it. Is, it. is it actually a productive resolution or is it really counterproductive? Are you setting yourself up for success or failure with this? Ask yourself, how many times have I tried to do this this way before? If the answer is more than once, then you're setting yourself up for failure because 
what we know is that every system is designed to produce the results it produces. So if you're using the same system to make the change that you've used in the past and have not had success with, then you need to change your system. Your system is just going to keep producing the result you don't want it to produce, right? This is this, this idea of, you know, being flexible in your methods, but stubborn in your goals, right? So be stubborn in your goals. Keep trying to make that change in the area that you know you need to make change in that's going to enrich your life and just lead you to a place of greater um, satisfaction. Don't give up on that goal. Be stubborn in your goal, but be flexible in your methods. Whatever you have been doing in the past, it's probably not the right approach for you. It's probably not the right method. If it's a, you know, three-week fast or dry January or, um, you know, joining the 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 some new gym every January that, you know, only lasts for a few weeks, um, those, that's not the right approach for you. You need to come up with something new. You need to tweak your system. And the way you tweak your system is you try something and you see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, then you say to yourself, okay, there's a problem with my system. I'm not setting myself up for success. What can I do to set myself up for better success? Oftentimes that involves scaling back on the goal. So you are in that situation, you're standing too far away from the bullseye. What I mean by that is that your goal is too lofty and too big for you. It feels overwhelming for your brain. It's probably not practically possible for you given your real life. And so you have set yourself up for failure. Tweak the system, pair, the, pair back your goal, simplify things. Instead of saying, I'm gonna to go to the gym five times a week, say, I'm gonna to go to the gym twice a week. Um, and set yourself up for success because when you succeed, you have the ability to celebrate that success. You're gonna feel like you've accomplished something. And we know that one of the really important pieces to uh, cementing new habits is um, accompanying that habit with a positive emotion. So when we have positive emotion, associated with our habit, with our the area of change we're trying to make, we're going to make that change far faster. So for all of those reasons, I want to encourage you, rethink your resolutions. Just have a think about them. Are they too lofty? Have you tried things this way before and failed? How can you set yourself up for greater success? Is your goal a quantitative goal or a qualitative goal? What would happen if this year you decided to set a goal around how you wanted to feel instead of how you wanted to act? Um, what would happen if you scaled back your goals and instead of setting a big goal um, based on some you know specific measurable accomplishment, you just said, oh, I just want to I just want to have better days. I want to increase the joy in my day. And then you focused on developing some habits that can help you to get there. Um, what would happen if you rethought your resolutions this year? What might be possible for you that has not been possible for you in years past? I hope you enjoyed that podcast. I hope I, I feel like I was kind of, um, I was on a bit of a tear there. Um, I tried to cover a whole bunch of different things, but I wanted to give you lots to think about. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that 2021 is a great year for all of you. I have great hope and optimism that things are turning around for us globally. Um, and I look forward to seeing what 2021 brings for me, um, but also what it brings for you. Um, and I hope that all of you have had the opportunity over the holidays to rest and recharge from what has been an incredibly challenging year. I know that I have appreciated my time off and I am looking forward to getting back into the swing of things, but not for another few days. You've been listening to Bite Size Balance with your host, Wendy McCallum. As a burnout and balance coach, I help busy high achievers like you create a more balanced, joyful life. To be sure you don't miss any upcoming Bite Size Conversations, subscribe now to this podcast. For more balance and wellness tips or to connect with me, visit my website at wendymccallum.com. That's W-E-N-D-Y-M-C-C-A-L-L-U-M.com.